Hello, Anatomy and Physiology. I am here with you today to talk to you guys about hemostasis. And um, what hemostasis is, is blood clotting. And there's a series of events that happen in a particular order. Um, and we're going to discuss that here as we take some notes. And then you'll do your typical homework assignment along with it. Um, so to begin here, I, um, I have information for you. Well, just a diagram here that's from your textbook um, that goes through essentially the three main steps of hemostasis. And you don't need to write this down yet because you'll write it down here in a minute. But um, first starts off with what's called a vascular spasm where the blood vessel that's been broken squeezes tightly to restrict how much blood can flow through um, to be the first step in stopping a bleed. And then you form a platelet plug where platelets gather in response to chemicals to um, create a temporary dam um, to the break where the bleed is happening. And then the third step is coagulation. And this is where the red blood cells then get trapped in the sticky fibrin um, mesh that's now been created. So it's those three steps in order, and you can kind of see the images um, there on the screen that go through them as we discuss those. So this is from page three in your note packet, right? Page three in your note packet. That's pretty much the whole place we're going to be at today as far as what notes you're going to want to take down. Um, so um, like I said, there's three main steps okay, of hemostasis. And um, hemostasis is, and go ahead and label your page either at the top or just off to the side of that picture. Um, this is hemostasis that we're labeling and working on. And what hemostasis is, is this process that stops bleeding. Okay? When you get an injury and your body stops. It takes about three to six minutes, um, of course, depending on the severity of the wound. And then um, if somebody was going to go into shock, that is when you've lost equal to or greater than 30% of your blood. Um, and so if somebody's lost more than 30% of the blood that's in their body, which on an average adult would be about a, a quart okay, of blood. So think of like one of those, um, not like the gallon milk jugs, but the small milk jugs, how much that looks like spilt out. That's about how much blood um, approximately um, would lead someone to shock. And by the way, um, the term hemorrhage um, is just another word for a bleed. So if someone is hemorrhaging, it just means that they're bleeding, but it depends on where that bleed is. If it's a brain hemorrhage, that means bleeding on the brain, and that can be more severe than other places where it might be hemorrhaging. Um, and so there's differences between that. But hemorrhage just means to bleed, um, and hemostasis stops it. All right, so like I mentioned, there's three steps. If you want to write these down off to the left, we're going to put information on this diagram and then underneath each of these, but at least lets you kind of see these three steps. So that first picture up here at the top, this is the depicting the vascular spasm. Um, then this picture and is the formation of the platelet plug. And then coagulation is sort of what's happening where it says one, two, and three down here at the bottom. All right. So I'm going to zoom in on each of these a little bit um, so that we can label appropriately. So step one, vascular spasm. Like I said, this is when the blood vessel is going to constrict. The reason it constricts is because platelets release um, the chemical signal serotonin, which serotonin is known as our happy um, hormone, well, not hormone, but chemical um, that signals different things in our body. But it is one of the um, happy feelings that we get. Ironically, platelets also secrete this um, when there's a break. Probably not a happy situation, ironically. Um, but it's not being transferred by neural pathways in your brain. So your body doesn't process it that way. So serotonin essentially is the chemical signal 
that is going to tell your cell, the blood vessel, to constrict. Um, also, the damaged cells, the tissues in that area, so these cells right here that have been damaged, they're going to release their own chemical signals in response to the injury as well. So in response to those chemicals being released, the smooth vessel, the, um, blood, the muscles in the blood vessel, which are smooth, they constrict. Okay? So if you want to label there, we've got a break, which is really kind of being depicted right here, a break in our vessel, platelets release serotonin, and vasoconstriction occurs. Remember, vasoconstriction is just the constriction of a blood vessel. Okay, so that is step one, vascular spasm. This happens very, very quickly um, within the first few seconds okay, of a break or a bleed. And then we um, just have this diagram, which is from what I showed you earlier, is that the smooth muscle contracts, causing vasoconstriction. All right. <clears throat> On to our next image here. Let me let the dog out. Hang on, you guys. You got it. Okay. Um, we'll just keep rolling. This is what it's like teaching from home. Um, so second step here is the formation of a platelet plug. And so as the name suggests, it, it's a plug of platelets. So the injury itself, when you have a rupture in a blood vessel, it's going to expose collagen fibers. We learned in the integumentary system that our skin is full of collagen. And so um, you have collagen all over the place, including surrounding your blood vessels. And so the exposed collagen um, become sticky. And those platelets adhere to the collagen fibers and they start to clump together and stick to each other. So the platelets stick to the collagen and then they also stick to each other. So the platelets are pictured as the small purple sort of shards that you see in here. Um, you can kind of even see like one like escaping okay, down under the bottom there. And then they form what we call the platelet plug, okay? That's where they've kind of stuck onto each other where that break occurred. All right. Now, um, one thing that I do want to point out to you is that these um, the platelet response is a positive feedback loop, which are a little bit more rare than negative feedbacks. Um, positive feedback is, remember, where the stimulus enhances the next stimulus. And so it gets stronger and stronger each time. So this sort of shows the cyclical cycle here where um, a cut, okay, a break or a tear happens in a vessel wall. So the platelets are going to release their chemical signals, which then attract more platelets. And the more platelets that show up are going to then um, release their chemical signal to attract more platelets. And when more platelets show up, they're going to release their chemical signal. And then more platelets are gonna show up and release. You see how it becomes very cyclical here. Depending on how bad the um, break is, hey, it will go on for some period of time. So just to kind of show you, remind you, uh, positive feedback doesn't have that up and down like most negative feedback systems in our body do. But instead, this increases exponentially. The more platelets in the area, the more signal it's going to be released, and then more platelets will show up, and then the signal is going to become stronger. So you sort of have this J-shaped graph or an exponential graph. Um, and so, anyways, eventually the feedback cycle will end once that platelet plug is formed, which doesn't take very long. Again, it depends on how big the bleed is. Um, but uh, in general, they can form that plug pretty quickly. I had to share this joke with you um, because it's a platelet party. That's exactly what happens in the platelet plug. I have to read it to you. So um, this is from my favorite comic, The Awkward Yeti. Uh, it does lots of anatomy jokes. But blood loss in sector G. Platelet party? This is serious business. There's no time for shenanigans. Plate, stop. Let, 
party, play the party. And I also want to point out that this is what I appreciate about this comment, comic that um, it says fibrin down here. You guys are about to going to learn that platelets are attracted to the fibrin mesh net. And so that's their um, beverage receptacle for their platelet party. So more and more platelets show up and then eventually you have this huge mass um, of a platelet party forming your platelet plug. All right. So continuing on here, okay, um, so we've got our labels. So that fibrin mesh clot is what I was referring to that you saw that the beverage of choice of those, um, actually they're really red blood cells, but the cells that we're drinking, um, we're drinking fibrin. And fibrin is essentially this really tough net that eventually forms at the very end of this whole process. But if you notice that this, we've got two arrows coming out and then that yellow arrow is coming back, we won't get to the fibrin mesh clot till the very end in that last step. Um, and so it's very important. All right, so in order to complete um, hemostasis and a um, full-fledged stopping of the bleed, um, we need clotting factors. So clotting factors are um, made by your liver and um, many of them require vitamin K. If you look and you read this section in your textbook about um, hemostasis, it has a big chart and it lists a lot of clotting factors. I'm only gonna mention a few essential ones here, um, but your liver makes most of them. So sometimes there's illnesses that affect the liver and then that will affect your body's ability to clot if you have a bleed. Um, so pl platelets release their own clotting factors that are going to kind of get the ball rolling. And it's called PF3, which stands for platelet factor three. Um, and we'll talk about them in a minute. And then also the ruptured cells. So you see like the red cells that were lining the blood vessel. They might be the muscle cells or the epithelial cells that actually are on the very outside of our blood vessel. Those damaged cells release another clotting factor called tissue factor or TF for short. So the damaged cells are releasing their own chemicals and these turn into clotting factors. A third one that's really important is calcium, which is free floating around in our body and our bloodstream. It's one of our essential ions. And so it's just there, but we, it requires all three of these things in order to clot right, and reach that final step. We will come back to the fibrin protein, but if you want to label this arrow here, um, the fibrin itself is what eventually is going to come back and make that fibrin mesh clot. All right, so this was step two that we just discussed, platelet plug formation. Um, first thing is the platelets adhere to the exposed collagen, and then they have a platelet party making a platelet plug. Um, there you go. So the clotting factor step here is sort of the in-between step that leads to our third and final step, which is coagulation. And um, so coagulation needs these in order to occur going to throw a bunch of big words at you here in just a minute, but hopefully we'll simplify it some. Um, coagulation just means blood clotting. This is actually red blood cells sticking to each other instead of platelets in this case. Um, we also use this word when we talk about blood typing, and if someone gets the wrong bl blood type, um, the blood cells also coagulate, which means clump together, which is something that you will see, um, at least in the image of the um, cells that are undergoing testing to see what blood types they are. And then um, the other thing that happens that's a key point here is that fibrin, which is our end product, forms a mesh that traps the red blood cells, which are erythrocytes, and along with the platelets and form the final clot that we get. And so you see that we have this arrow going back up to that fibrin mesh that's at the all right, so it takes all three, and honestly more, of these clotting factors 
to start the ball rolling. And keep in mind, this happens very quickly, three to six minutes for a clot to form. Um, but all of these things um, start the ball rolling with these different um, chemicals in our body. So we have this one chemical called the prothrombin activator. And just like the name suggests, it activates prothrombin. And so prothrombin is a um, chemical that then stimulates thrombin. Pro comes before um, thrombin. Thrombin is an enzyme and enzymes speed up chemical reactions. And so they will, um, it's a key in this next step. Thrombin is then going to activate the protein fibrinogen, which is a plasma protein. It's just free floating around in our cells, but this isn't going to then, excuse me, it then turns into fibrin. And that's what we want. That's the end game. That was what our little platelet parties were drinking out of um, in that comic. And so what fibrin is, is, a protein. It is insoluble, meaning it does not break down in water, which is a good thing because this is in blood and in plasma, and most of plasma is water. And it's these thread-like strands that trap red blood cells. Now, I just threw a lot of words at you, okay? Do not feel, you do on your homework assignment, need to know what these are in order to finish the assignment, but it's pretty simple if you just follow the arrows. Right, if you follow the arrows on this chart here, um, the assignment's pretty easy. You get a paragraph and you have to fill in the blanks. Um, so we have, because of the damaged cells, the platelets and damaged cells, they release clotting factors. Along with calcium, they initiate the process where prothrombin activator stimulates prothrombin to stimulate thrombin to stimulate fibrinogen to make fibrin, okay? Now, please don't feel like you need to memorize every one of those steps, but what we call this is a cascade effect. And a cascade is, and like we live in Cascade County, um, I don't know if you know what a cascade is, but it's a waterfall, okay? Or it's a waterfall where you have like a series of waterfalls um, running into each other. Um, I'll get to that here in just a second. That picture reminded me. So this fibrin, it's like a net, okay? Like a net that's going to catch the red blood cells. And that's what this image is from your textbook. So all of these, um, it looks like spider webs. That's fibrin and it's trapping red blood cells. So it forms this really intense mesh net and it's going to trap the red blood cells. They're going to die. And then it forms our scab that will eventually help protect our wound as it heals. Now, back to the cascade effect here. Um, this is a little bit more complicated um, version of what we just went through. But basically, the premise is still here. We have a whole bunch of arrows where this thing stimulates this thing that stimulates this thing that stimulates this thing. And it starts to sort of waterfall down. The water at the top joins down with water at the bottom. And eventually we get to our end goal. And in this case, it is our fibrin mesh. So I, if you need help, that's me, by the way, in that picture. But this is a picture of a cascade, right? Um, which is basically like where a waterfall, like you kind of start up here, there's a little waterfall that joins up with more water. And then there's a large drop. And then it comes, you can't see it comes behind the trees, but then there's more waterfalls and waterfalls and water. We call that a cascade, okay, where um, everything starts building onto each other here. That's the same idea here. This cascade of different things that become activated is a part of the end goal is making that fibrin mesh net to trap red blood cells. All right. So our last step here okay, is coagulation. You have fibrin okay, that forms this mesh that traps our blood cells, which is forming our official end of the clot with coagulation. All right. So not everybody's body always does this as best as it can. Okay? And so there's some diseases and disorders relating to blood clotting. 
you can. Um, we already put some diseases and disorders um, of our white blood cells and red blood cells. You have a blank on the back of your notes. This would be a good place to add these little notes to you. But I've divided it into three different groups here. We have the thromboembolic disorders, bleeding disorders, and then we're going to talk what DIC is there at the end. So um, what thromboembolic disorders are, are just undesirable blood clots. We want our blood to clot when we're bleeding. We don't want our blood to clot when we're not bleeding because it leads to problems. So a thrombus is a clot that forms in an unbroken blood vessel. So if you have a, um, for whatever reason, your cells start sticking together in the middle of a blood vessel, we call that a thrombus. Now this one is stationary. It's not moving around if it's a thrombus. Okay. The problem with a thrombus is it can block your blood flow if it gets too big. So you can imagine a, a clot or this platelet plug and mesh net forming. It can essentially block flow from a certain area of your body, which would then lack of blood to the area would cause the tissues not to get oxygen and nutrients and potentially die. Most parts of your body, there's other routes to get to, um, but there are very, very important places that you don't want blood to be blocked, especially in your brain, especially to your heart, um, and then some major arteries and veins that you have, especially in your legs. Um, but an embolus, maybe you've heard the term embolism, um, but this is when the clot, like a thrombus, breaks away and starts traveling through the body. So if you have a clot also maybe that's formed from the site of an injury, but then that clot breaks off and is now free floating around throughout the whole network of your body, um, it uh, can cause problems because if it then gets stuck somewhere else, an embolism can happen. Um, now, a problem with, as I mentioned, um, a cerebral embolism is a stroke. So that is literally when you have something blocking the blood. And in this case, it's a blood clot where it shouldn't be um, in your brain and you have lack of blood flow to the brain and then your brain cells start to die. And you, if it's not treated quickly enough, which it can be treated. Um, and so looking for signs of stroke, like um, droopiness on one side of the face versus the other, because usually it affects one side of the brain that's lacking oxygen and blood flow and so you might see like the lips and like the muscles on one side of the face sort of droop um, if one arm or another becomes weak if a person becomes dizzy um, these are signs and symptoms that you need to get them to the hospital immediately it can be treated but you have to get them very quickly um, long-term effect of a stroke is lack of um, nervous control to those parts of the body so you might have to learn how to retrain your mouth to speak um, because your lips don't form the shapes of words like they used to, learning how to write and eat and some basic motor skills, depending on how bad the stroke is and how long that part of the brain went without oxygen. It also depends on where the stroke, what part of the brain it affected. Um, all right. So that's what an embolism is, okay, is a clot that free floated around and then eventually laid up in the brain. Um, all right. There are anticoagulant drugs, which sound just like the name suggests, anticoagulation. So it prevents um, clots from forming. So these inhibit our clotting factors. Some really common um, anticoagulant drugs. Aspirin, very common one. If somebody is at risk for a stroke, they might be prescribed to take daily aspirin. Um, it's a simple treatment and a cheap medicine that you can take to prevent um, strokes, basically. Um, heparin is another one, which we've learned that your white blood cells, um, your basal fills, they secrete in an effort to have a immune or inflammation response. And then warfarin is another one that might be given um, at the hospital um, in more serious situations. All right, so bleeding disorders, this is when you are bleeding abnormally. 
So we, there's normal bleeding and not normal bleeding. Okay. And so um, if you're bleeding and it doesn't stop, that would be an example of like hemophilia, for example. Um, but someone might bleed uncontrollably if they have low platelets. And that is thrombocytopenia. Thrombocytopenia. Um, and this is where you have low platelets, usually due to an issue with your red marrow. Uh, it could be a side effect of like cancer of the bone or other diseases that affect your bone marrow. But um, this is a another issue or a side effect for people with certain bone diseases is that they aren't producing platelets. And so they can't, um, their blood won't stop bleeding if they get an injury. Uh, then you have impaired livers. As we mentioned, livers make many of your clotting factors. Oftentimes it's due to a lack of vitamin K. So if there is not enough vitamin K in your diet, um, that can affect your liver or if the liver isn't functioning as it should and it just doesn't make its clotting factor. And then hemophilias, which perhaps you've heard of before, but these are a hereditary disease and disorder where you don't have the genes to make all of the clotting factors. So um, some individuals get transfusions with blood that has the clotting factors they have to have those transfusions regularly so that it's in their bloodstream in case of an injury. Um, if they do get injured, even the smallest clot cut that usually could be stopped at home with bandages and things like that will not stop bleeding. So they have every little injury, they have to go to the hospital to get a transfusion with the clotting factors to make that injury stop. Um, the problem is also sometimes we have internal bleeding. So if you don't actually, if you are in a car crash or something and um, you could face internal hemorrhaging, internal bleeding, and um, your body wouldn't be able to stop the bleed much like a normal person's at least could slow down um, depending on the how bad the injury was. And then this last one I want to mention because... Um, Many of my students are females, and this is something to be concerned about if and when you are pregnant, which is called DIC, or Disseminated Intravascular Coagulation. Very fancy word for uncontrolled bleeding, um, but this is widespread. So um, it, it's uh, a little bit of both, okay? So there's severe bleeding and also widespread clotting at the same time. Uh, so these two things are happening opposite of each other at the same time. Um, there are some, and it can be deadly. Um, the a main cause of this is actually complications related to pregnancy. Um, someone will know if they're at a higher chance of having this through their regular doctor visits. Um, I don't want to terrify you guys at all about being pregnant or anything like that, but um, if you've heard of things like preeclampsia, and we'll talk about some of those, I'll show you a picture. Um, but that can lead to um, DIC at childbirth, usually not before, or usually would be close to um, the point of childbirth. Um, septicemia, which is like sepsis, which is blood infections. So if you have an infection in your bloodstream, that means that the infected blood is everywhere in your body because your blood goes everywhere in your body. Um, it can lead to severe bleeding and widespread clotting because your blood is infected. It's not doing what it needs to be doing. And then lastly, it's kind of covered up here, but when we talk about our blood, excuse me, <clears throat> our blood types, um, if somebody got an incompatible blood transfusion, meaning the wrong blood, not what they're supposed to be like receiving, I'm O positive, I have to only receive O positive blood. Um, I'm one of those individuals that can only accept the exact same blood type as myself. Um, luckily, it's the most common one. So usually there's not too big of an issue with a shortage. But um, if I got O negative blood, Okay, or um, AB blood or something, then I would be um, at risk of having DIC, widespread clotting and severe bleeding at the same time. All right, so back to the pregnancy issue. Um, what can happen 
is um, a, so here we have the baby in the uterus, okay? Um, the vaginal canal is right here, and then the cervix is right here where the baby is. This is usually in the third trimester, late term. But the placenta is essentially um, the part that's surrounding the fetus inside the uterus, and there's lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of blood in the placenta. The placenta is essentially what nourishes the baby and what forms the umbilical cord, the connection between the mother and the baby. And so this is where baby's food comes from and where the oxygen for the baby comes from is all through the placenta, which is then transferred to the baby through the umbilical cord. What unfortunately happens sometimes is that the uterine wall, which is this muscle right here, um, can separate or pull away from the placenta. When that happens, a bunch of blood ends up forming um, in this like pool here, essentially. And then at childbirth okay, or pre-childbirth, kind of or a complication that happens at the same time as childbirth, um, if there's massive hemorrhaging, massive, massive bleeding, that is a sign essentially that the placenta has torn away um, from the uterine wall. Because the baby's blood type might be different from the mom's, it might, the mom's body might end up um, be treating it like an incompatible blood transfusion. And that's where we have severe bleeding through the uterus, as well as widespread clotting in other places of the body, essentially from this mixed um, issue. If you've ever watched um, a TV show or a movie, like where there's an at-home birth or like it's old timey and like someone's giving birth and something's not going right and there's lots of blood. This is oftentimes um, sort of what deadly thing that they're referring to. But thankfully, hospitals now know to look for these signs and symptoms with regular ultrasounds and they also know to um, how to treat it. Um, and they do. I, um, so anyways, if you ever hear that term DIC, we read about it later in life. Um, that's what it's about. So it is deadly if not treated, if not treated. Anyways, on that very happy note, that is our discussion of hemostasis. Uh, you have a homework assignment to complete with it. Um, follow the arrows. That'll help you with the paragraph. Okay. As always, email me, message me on your mind if you have any questions at all. And I hope you guys are staying well and staying safe. Hasta luego.